Uh, that's why I feel passionate about this thing, that we've got to figure out what's causing the problem. And I don't think that it's going to vanish. I think it's going to go through in waves. And I tend to believe beekeepers who say it tends to reoccur every three or four years. And I'll tell you why. So, what do we see? Every bee yard we went to, we sampled bees from the best colonies, the worst colonies, and the intermediate colonies. And the ones in the process of collapse all had Nosema. They had Nosema serrana, or Nosema serrana and Nosema apis. And they all had iridescent invertebrate virus, or a what we would technically call an iridescent-like virus, because we know it's a DNA virus, but we think we've got an unsequenced virus, one that has never been fully characterized. It's either new or variant. And so, but it is, odds are, it is truly an iridescent virus. And it was in all of the collapsing colonies. The highest titer of these two pathogens occurred in those in the process of collapsing. The titers of both pathogens increased as the collapse progressed. We had an observation hive that I had. We had a bunch of collapsed colonies in Montana. I threw one of them as it got down to that remnant of bees and a queen into an observation hive. And it produced a second queen. You ever seen an observation hive with two queens in it? One on one side, one on the other. That colony built like it was going like gangbusters and then it collapsed again. And we had counters on us so we could count the exodus of bees and they went out in progressive waves. There'd be a wave and they'd go out and then they'd slow down a bit and then another wave. And as we watched the titers, the titers of these two passages they'd go up and a wave of bees would go up. And then the titers would drop down and they'd, they'd, they'd kind of stabilize for a bit and then they'd go up again and then the bees would go drop out until we got down to one queen and six bees. And at which point we quit the experiment. Um, so the titers of these things, and when these things peak, that's when the bees exit. And that's the unique thing about CCD. They're not dead in the bottom of the box. They're not dead in front of the hive. You can't even find them in the yard. You walk out of the fields, you can't find them. They're dispersed to the, you know, I'm, they have to die. That, either that or it's alien abduction, and I think I'm probably assuming that dying is probably the more likely scenario. <laughs> They're not showing up in your neighbor's hives, you know. They just, just are here. They just fly over the hill and they're gone. I suspect that they're just weak and sick. Yes, sir? Simple explanation of tire, please. Oh, tire is concentration. Okay. Amount. Yeah, and feel free to call out. I, I try to keep the jargon down, but you remember, I'm indoctrinated in this stuff, so uh, just yell out. Uh, concentrate your mouth and something. Okay. So, this, interesting enough, it never totally disappears out of the bees, at least the virus does. The strongest colonies and the collapsed ones have the lowest concentration or amount of the virus, but it's generally, it's often detectable at very, very low levels in both the strongest colonies and the fully collapsed ones. What we're suspecting is happening here is that at least in the fully collapsed ones, you're down to the queen and some very, very young bees. I mean, really fuzzy little bees. Uh, in my observation hive, I saw these fuzzy bees foraging. I have never seen bees that young forage in the summer. I assume they're desperate. You know, they're pressed into service, trying to, trying to keep that brood alive and so on. Either those young bees are somewhat resistant to this, or more likely they're just so young that they haven't had enough time for the level of this stuff to build up in them, so you've got a little bit of a, you know, a breathing room there and so on. Um, and it's not real surprising that the strongest ones have it because these are all from say operations that were collapsing. So it had to start somewhere. So it was probably endemic or sitting in the background there and so on. And then it expresses I mean, you and I walk around with things like influenza and stuff like that. We've got a little bit. If we did proteomics on us, you'd find these things. But, you know, today I feel fine and so on. But if I get stressed out and so on, these things start to reproduce themselves and so on. And off we are going sick. I think this thing lurks in the background. All right, it is both the uh, fungus, the nosema, and the iridescent virus can be found in the gut of a bee. Um, the virus eventually can spread to other organs and to the malpigium tubules and the fat bodies and so on, but you will find them initially in the gut of the bee. Both of them thrive in cool, wet environments. Both of them, uh, oh, and the iridescent virus is notorious for a unique aspect. 
At low levels, it's imp almost impossible with anything other than this proteomics to see. So it's hidden or covert. covert. It's not obvious it's there. And when something triggers it to express itself, and it goes into what we call a full-blown infection or a patent infection, it is almost invariably lethal. That's across all the insect hosts that iridescent viruses occur in, and there's a large number of them. So we've got something like typhoid that can be carried by survivors, that hides, not obvious, it's, you know, the carrier's walking around looking fine, and when it hits you and so on, by the time you know you got typhoid and so on, now in today's modern medicine, we got a little bit of a chance if you can get a fast enough jump on it, but this thing just goes through like wildfire when it does, and it's, it's you know, it's the lethality is what's really of concern. And Trevor basically has looked at this. There are about 33 insects that we know have iridescent viruses. I suspect there's a lot more. It's just how many have been looked at so far. But in all of those, this is a common theme. Hidden low-level infections, and then they go full-blown. They just wipe their hosts out and so on. This is not good news to beekeepers, all right? So... People say, oh no, we haven't found it and so on, it can't be there and so on. Well, we found it from, we looked at bee operations from the east coast to the west coast. You know, I'm from the west, so I've seen a lot more western bees than some of the other investigators and so on. Uh, and there is a tendency in a lot of literature on this to track bees from, your, from the east coast areas over to the central area of California, especially those come out of Pennsylvania and Florida and jump over to California. Well, we track those. But we also tracked bees that had to run from Minnesota and North Dakota over to California and from Texas over to California and so on. And we see connections back and forth between all those. And there were Michigan beekeepers in the very first year, even though it wasn't widely known, but there was at least one that had a real problem with this thing in the very early days of this. So we have seen this in 2006, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and so on. And 11, we are getting we're still getting some reports. Now, the worst year for 2006 7 um, and, and last year, 2009, from what we've seen. Uh, we also have time series sampling. We had this observation high that collapsed and we, we followed the tighter through weeks and a couple months and so on as they went down. We did, we looked within there, within eight areas of stockpile yards, from the best colonies to the worst colonies. And we've also looked at operations that have no history of CCD versus those that do. And guess what? The ones that have no history of CCD, and I can believe them, they're folks that I know and trust, also don't tend to have the iridescent. Although it's not in our paper because we didn't have enough samples, we have picked up samples from places like Hawaii and Louisiana where a beekeeper had an extremely high level of nosema, but no iridescent, and the bees look fine. It makes you wonder whether they'll see it by itself is a real problem or if it's combined, much like mites and viruses being combined. We think that's what we're looking at here. Um, so the operations with the history of CCD always have this thing in them. Uh, operations with no history of CCD, we've got one large non-migratory operation in Montana called the Smoot, uh, owned by the Smoots. Uh, they don't migrate. They used to because we're in a very, very cold area. They're up against Glacier Park. They used to kill off all their bees in the winter and then restock in the spring. Now they sell off all their bees in the fall to the pollinators and they restock in the spring. So they, they're running annual bees. And their bees have the lowest levels of virus and mites that we've seen anywhere in the United States. They're doing something right. And it's a, an extreme type of beekeeping. They tell me they have no case of history of CCD. I've looked at their colonies. I see no evidence of it. I've seen some of the strongest colonies I've seen in years in the smooth operation. They don't have the virus. And so, bees from Hawaii, no virus. So, bees from Australia, no virus. And with the paper in Science early on that tried to blame the Australians for this Israeli acute paralysis virus. Actually, IAPV, we find it in our samples. Guess what? From our samples, IAPV is a good thing because if you got IAPV, you probably don't have the iridescent virus. <laughs> it's actually a better marker of non-CCD colonies from our studies than it is of the reverse. Okay. All right, so here's an interesting thing. Is this something new? Well, you might think it's, it's new. Check my timer. 
Uh, but no, in fact, in India, 20 years ago, about the time tracheobite showed up, the people in India said that they had up to 40 or higher percent losses of bees. They sent samples to Bailey and Ball in, in um, the UK. They were the resident experts on bee diseases at the time. And they were, the Indians were blaming their losses on tracheomyia. And when Bailey and Ball got a hold of them in their research group, they said, well, there are tracheomites in some of the samples, but not on all of them. But there's this DNA virus, an iridovirus that's in them. Now, at that time, the only way you could find it is do some type of look under an electron microscope. These things are extremely tiny and so on. So they used uh, TEM. They didn't have genomics approaches. They didn't have proteomics at that time. But they saw a virus that was a DNA virus, and it was an Arito virus, and it had all the characteristics of it. They inoculated, and this was in Apicerana, the bee, the native bee in India. Not mellifera, but Apicerana. <coughs> and they were worried because even at that time, there were more and more your Western bees being brought into India in place of proximity to Serana. And Bailey and Ball then decided to inoculate Apis mellifera bees with the virus from the Apis serrana bee. And guess what? It proliferated and took out the, the uh, mellifera. So they issued a warning. You shouldn't put western bees next to the native bee in India because this virus can jump species. And yeah, they had a big warning about it. Did anybody pay any attention to it? No, until we found this thing and so on. Nobody even remembered that they had talked about iridescent viruses and so on. Um, interesting enough, Apis serrana is also the bee we think we got Nosema serrana, the fungus from. And it's also where Cadmir virus comes from. So we're wondering, one possibility is maybe a whole suite of pathogens jumped from Apis serrana, the native bee in India, to our western honeybee. And we got them all as a suite. And our bee was ill-prepared to deal with a suite of new pathogens, all hitting at once. In Spain, there is a, is probably one of the few countries in the world that I would agree, when they say they have colony collapse, may have something that fits the signs or symptoms of what I call colony collapse. Worldwide, there's a general decline in bees. I've been in South America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. Most of those problems are not what I call CCD. They're real. They're a decline, but they're not what we call CCD. But in Spain, I'm reasonably convinced they probably have what we call CCD. There's a group of investigators there that are convinced Nosema serrana is the cause of CCD. But when this paper was about ready to hit, I got a hold of them and said, you've got some tech reports where you've actually gone out and looked at colonies, and I see back to 2000, you have reports of occasionally seeing a, an iridescent virus in your bee samples. Have you looked at that in conjunction with Nosema? And the answer was no. Uh, it's a laborious process to look for that thing, so we've noted a couple times, but we really haven't concentrated on it. But how soon can I send you samples? Because I wouldn't be surprised at all if we had a connection between the two. Uh, Northeastern U.S. in the 90s, big collapse. Scott Camazin went out to look at it. He wanted to if uh, mites had something to do with it, so he grabbed some mites out of a collapsing colony. And when he looked at the mites, he found an iridescent virus in them. Now, this was of interest to Scott because years ago, when cashmere was first noticed in the U.S. and Canada, Scott Camzim was on part of a team that did the sequencing, the genomic typing, of cashmere beard virus. But interestingly enough, they accidentally discovered cashmere in a sample of iridescent virus sent over from India because they were curious about the iridescent. And as a contaminant in the iridescent virus sample, they found cashmere. So this is an interesting history of little studies here and there that have forgotten and been forgotten or never made any waves. I talked to Scott and he said, I was almost embarrassed that I put out that little note that I had seen it. And he said, I only found one colony and it went back and they were all dead so I couldn't do any more samples. I'm sure glad you took that sample because I know there was an iridescent. About the time the big collapses occurred in the Peace River area up in Canada. And they attributed that to cashmere bee virus. 
But the signs or symptoms they describe fit something called clustering disease. And clustering disease comes to us courtesy of our friends in India because they describe strange circumstances where bees didn't cluster well over the brood nests and so on, and they attributed that to the iridescent virus. So was the case up in Peace River cashmere, or was it iridescent? We can't, I'd love to find somebody with a freezer who's got some samples so I can answer that question. But it's an intriguing detective story. So, let's move on. So we also did some inoculation trials. Now, People say, well, how come it took you so long to get to this, and why didn't you publish earlier? And the issue is, is that we didn't get any of the uh, major money that was allocated out for doing bee research, even though we were first on the one of the first on the ground. Um, so we made we do commodity groups like uh, the Almond Board, California Beekeepers, Idaho Beekeepers, Montana Beekeepers, some individual donations and stuff. Uh, we've scraped together just enough money to do this, and the Army donated all the analysis and so on. So that's the only way we get it done. And we had to basically do our day jobs to think, pay the bills and stuff and try to work on this on the side. So it took us a while to work all this out. One of the things you do in this kind of thing is if you can inoculate the host with what you suspect has caused the problem, induce the problem, and then recover the inoculate from the dead and dying bees, then you have fulfilled something called culture conscious pasta, K-O-C-H-S. Um, because we don't have the money to do so, isolating, sequencing, and typing the specific virus that we have is beyond our reach until we find some significant funding to do that. We have submitted proposals. We have been trying. Uh, so far, it's fallen on deaf ears. But we were able to get iridescent six. And iridescent 6 is one of the iridescent viruses. It's the type specimen. It's the one that was one of the first that was identified, and it grows and <coughs> proliferates in moths, especially wax moth. And it is the closest match from the proteins to the one we found. So Sean Billamoria is an expert in that down in Texas. He's provided us with the uh, iridescent 6. And Rob Kramer inoculated cages of bees in the lab with Nosema, with iridescent 6, and a combination of the two. And Nosema, as you might expect, in a couple of weeks took out a fair number of bees, and iridescent did about the same. And the two together, in some cases, in 10 days, wiped out everything. So it's circumstantial, but it's a compelling argument that the interaction of these two may be what's really going on. Why are they called iridescent? Well, these are very, really large viruses. Um, the viruses that, the RNA viruses that you hear about are generally 19, 20, 29 nanometers in size. Now, that's an incredibly small number, but, but believe me, you've got to use a, tra a transmission electron microscope to see them. <coughs> so take something in the 20 to 30 range and bump it up to 120 to 180, and that's the size of this DNA virus. It is a a cosylhedral, there is one for you, one for our young folks to ponder. What does the word a cosylhedral mean? You know, we hear words like octagon and, and triangles. Well, a cosylhedral, I had to look it up, 20 sided. Imagine these things kind of like a geodesic dome. They got flat, but they're mostly a giant sphere. And until recently, the only way you can find them is look at it under a high power microscope. But with genomics and proteomics, we have new tools that can look at and identify them. Uh, it occurs in insects, amphibians, and fish. <coughs> you ever heard of African swine fever? Go look it up. You'll find it sounds just like CCD. And when it was first found, they thought it came, swine fever was seen in South Africa in the same areas as HIV. And they thought swine fever was HIV. But then they took a harder look and said, it's an iridescent. And then the genomics guys came in and said, well, it's really like an iridescent, but it's a little different on the ones in the insects and fish, so it's going to have its own group. And so it is, isn't technically the same, but it's an icosylhedral DNA virus with, uh, with about the same size. And you can get colored organs in the affected swine and so on. And if you, you know, all you have to do is substitute B for fish or for swine, peeps, you know, and you, you just described CCD. Now, that may be anecdotal, but it was rather intriguing and so on. 